privacy international is a london based ngo similar to org we've had the privilege over the last few weeks of sitting on our asses working from home um, i've been here confined in this room with my two cats who have not had the privilege of being around with me for so long and what i've been doing is essentially trying to read every single story about how this crisis is leading to more surveillance or having implications with privacy around the world. So what we're trying to do is track every single example that we can find, summarise what's going on and then try and explain all the surveillance measures that we've seen. And we're working with a group of activists from around the world to try and get all these together and they're now all available on privacyinternational.org. So I'll we'll talk a bit about Palantir later on, but I think it's just important to put the company and what we're seeing around the world at the moment into context. So I would say really looking at everything that's happening in its totality, and uh, what we're seeing is really unprecedented in terms of its global scale, even after some of the measures imposed after September 11th. Now, a lot of these are actually quite more or less necessary, you would say. Um, a lot, however, appear to be quite reckless because they're either rushed or poorly designed. And a lot are essentially turn out to be just power grabs by those who are capitalizing on this crisis for various purposes. So on that, we're now in a situation where we're left with what is an effective dictatorship as an EU member state in Hungary. States such as Romania are derogating from the European Convention on Human Rights. And we've seen the rollout of every type of surveillance that you could imagine is now being tested on every corner of the globe. So a lot of this isn't even particularly high tech. So for example, you have the use of networks of informants in places like Vietnam, who are used to check up to ensure that people who are in quarantine are where they're supposed to be. You have authorities publishing people's names. So for example, in the Balkans, you have the Bosnian and Montenegrin authorities publishing people's actual names on publicly accessible websites, which in some cases has led to their abuse. In parts of India, you have authorities stamping people's hands with indentable ink um, just to notify who's supposed to be under quarantine. And then you also have very basic measures such as police checking up on people um, and the use of the military in public spaces also. So these measures really kind of range up to some pretty high tech forms also. So for example, telco location data has received a lot of attention um, and from our last count, we've counted that uh, it's in use by some 23 countries in various forms around the world. And this could either be through the triangulation of cell towers or through location metadata taken from uh, calls being made or from the apps themselves. Now, this is being done for things like contact tracing, which is more effective in earlier stages of uh, epidemic control. Uh, so, for example, in Pakistan, people are being sent texts telling them to quarantine um, and it's leading to people not really understanding why. So, for example, some family members will receive a message while others don't. So it's quite uh, fuzzy as to what criteria they're using um, for quarantining people. And then you also have countries like in Ecuador who are monitoring people through GPS um, and then you also have countries like Italy and UK who are planning on using it for trend analysis. So trying to see more rod movements in places and patterns uh, rather than trying to identify the individual location of individuals. So on top of that, we've also seen some 14 countries deploying apps used to track people's movements in various ways. So these can either rely on proximity and location data such as Bluetooth, GPS, or even Wi-Fi data. So for example, in Poland, um, you have those who have been ordered to quarantine uh, have to download an app and on request by authorities, they have to send a photo of themselves, which then also gives their GPS location and their photo is verified using facial matching by the police. In China, um, you have a color-coded app, so depending on your risk of contracting the virus, some people are restricted in terms of their access to public spaces or access to public travel uh, based on what color code they have within that app. And in Hong Kong and in Taiwan, I think you also have the use of electronic tags, so 
resources that are linked to an app that are make sure that you have to remain in the area that you're supposed to be for quarantine. So on top of these kind of measures, you also have other enforcement techniques that range from the use of drones. So um, I think most famously for us here in the UK by Derbyshire Police, to the utilization of facial recognition networks. So for example, in Russia, um, and then also the wide scale use of travel data. So PNR data from the airlines, for example, or data from public transport, such as trains. What we're also seeing is a big bunch of scams and misinformation that's been circulated. And what this has also led to is governments trying to crack down on this in some ways that are better than others. So for example, unfortunately, we've also seen authorities using it to censor journalists who are questioning official figures or who are questioning the government response. Um, and we've also seen things like authorities in Uzbekistan taking people's phones so that they don't spread misinformation. So we're in this weird place now where reacting to the same crisis, you have authorities in Uzbekistan who are confiscating people's phones, whereas at the same time authorities in South Africa are actually giving people's phones because they understand that it's a good way of tracking folk ostensibly. I think going forward, um, what we're going to see, so for example, if you have a situation where some people will be allowed to return to public spaces or to work and some people aren't, what you expect to see is the rollout of more biometric technology, especially touchless biometric technology that's used to identify people. So one biometric industry publication summarized it quite well like this. This was yesterday. In the same way that 9-11 created 20 years of security innovation around identity, the coronavirus epidemic will spur decades of security innovation around health status. And I think that's what we're going to see going forward and um, the wide scale use of biometrics for identity purposes. Now, depending on the context of where these tools or measures are imposed, some are obviously less worrying than others. Ultimately, it needs to come down to ensuring that the response is driven by evidence and particularly health evidence. So for example, in Israel, which uses both apps and telco tracking by the internal uh, state security agency, a few days ago, you had the body which represents medics coming out and saying that they've essentially not involved any health experts in that and they've been totally ignored. So as well as being a distraction from um, helping with things like making sure that people have access to testing or making sure those on the front line have personal protective gear, it's actually distracting from that. And even worse than that, um, by not involving the health experts, you're also quarantining people who you don't need to. So for example, some people who should be at work helping to deal with this crisis are put under quarantine because of the wrong measures being implemented. And then there's also just ways of implementing these measures that are more lawful, more proportionate and come with better safeguards. So, for example, you could do things like making sure that there is a statutory footing for the law and making sure that any measures are actually temporary. So, with, for example, a sunset clause in any legislation that comes up. You could allow people to consent uh, based on accurate information about their privacy will be affected and anonymised to the greatest extent, extent that you could do that uh, and make sure people are informed as to the limits of that anonymization process. You have to make sure that there's purpose limitation and that only those who need to actually respond to the public emergency have access uh, and ensure that people have access to judicial rem remedies after and that there's sufficient oversight into those measures. So for example, through parliamentary committees or other bodies or regulators. Um, I mean, not, none of that is particularly sexy stuff. It's not as in any way cool as just throwing high tech surveillance or a big surveillance company at the problem, but it's really what you'd expect any authority who cares about the welfare of the citizens to be doing. Um, so that's how you kind of wiggle stuff in addition to some of the technical open solutions that I think we'll be talking about later. What we've also seen happening is that in a attempt to use this essentially an opportunity for companies who are usually anything but transparent to perhaps boast about some of their response. So you have surveillance companies such as NSO Group, which is currently being sued by WhatsApp for targeting the platform as it was being used by activists and others. 
um, coming up and getting involved and trying to help with the scandal. Uh, social media companies such as Facebook, which has had its own scandals, and big telcos all now deciding that it's time to open up about their products and their customers. And I think for sure there's likely a deal of opportunism and uh, companies using this crisis as an opportunity to wander their reputations or for a profit further down the line. So I think with that, um, completely unrelated to that, it's also worth now just going into Palantir and what is they're doing with the NHS. So for background Palantir, as Mike said, Silicon Valley based analytics company founded by Peter Thiel with CIA and other funding, uh, known mostly for its work with intelligence and police agencies. Now the company would argue that it's essentially a neutral software company, perhaps akin to Microsoft Excel or something like that, uh, that would allow people to connect and analyze disparate data sources. But it's also intimately involved in highly controversial government programs and some of the most far-reaching surveillance programs in existence. So, for example, um, it allows law enforcement in the US by co co connecting the various databases together to search for individuals by name and thereby gain intimate access to their family relations, financial information, contact details and physical attributes. Palantirs also enables uh, X-Keyscore. This is one of the most, was described, widest range of programs of the NSA, which is obviously the world's most sophisticated spy agency and is fairly instrumental in helping ICE, which is the Immigration Enforcement Agency in the US, target people for deportation, including family members of unaccompanied children. So in the last week, it's reported that about a dozen governments are currently using Palantir software and that it's in talks with around seven more. So at the moment, I think we know that Austria, Canada, Greece, Spain, and the US, CDC in the US, and the NHS in the moment um, are using that. So as Mike said, also it's ostensibly to predict the locations of outbreaks and determine where to deploy medical staff and facilities uh, and as part of its software program called Foundry. So needless to say, I mean, we're in this situation really where I think everyone's just anxious for any help that they can get and anyone who's helping the NHS is particularly welcome whether you're you know, a highly controversial surveillance company or not. Um, but there's still a bunch of issues with this that um, activists and others will be concerned about. So for example, the company um, has said that it will just be the data processor and that the data will still remain under the control of the NHS. But given the circumstances and how rushed the procurement has been and this whole process, and also the fact that we know in the past the NHS has been working with big tech companies and has failed to live up some of those provisions. So for example, one of the trusts was found to be not in breach of data protection law in 2017 for handing personal details of over one and a half million people to Google. Um, so unfortunately, there's previous circumstances and really simple assurances in a blog post are really enough here. And that's particularly because health data is really one of the most sensitive data sets there is. And for that reason, it's also one of the most highly prized by tech firms. So any deals that give them access, not only present extreme red flags, but it also needs to come with extreme transparency measures and accountability. One other area that um, we're concerned about is the potential for vendor lock-in. So for example, while Palantir may be doing this temporarily um, on a time-limited basis, we need to know what mitigation measures are in place to ensure that the NHS isn't left relying on the firm as time goes by. So for example, in the past, Palantir clients have complained that they aren't able to transfer the analysis that's been generated by the software to new systems. And we also need to know particularly if this particular product of Palantir Foundry will in any way be used to inform the analysis or learning systems that make any of its other products work. And of course, there's the risk that the NHS will in turn turn to Palantir in the future as a result of this, because Palantir has developed all this knowledge and learning from these contracts. So that eventually down the line, public health money will be going to 
uh, Palantir, which is essentially a company that's instrumental in global surveillance operations. And then that also leads just the general issue of public trust, which at a moment like this is absolutely essential. So bringing in one of the most notorious, I would say, surveillance companies to handle what is one of the most sensitive data sets is really not conducive at this moment to enhancing public trust, I would argue. And so on top of those things, ultimately, I would argue it comes down to this, that we really shouldn't be in a position where we're left relying on what I would say is a tool of counterterrorism to deal with what is a public health emergency. So having to rely on Palantir is a symptom that essentially we've been unprepared for this. So even though we knew there was warnings that something like this might be on the horizon. So once this crisis is over, we have to get to a point where there exists enough resources put into public services and the health sector and open solutions, which mean that when a crisis like this comes up, we're not then simply just left with a choice where we leave the NHS unable to act or we have to put our trust in a company like Palantir. And in that vein, I would argue that if there's one good thing to come from this crisis, it's the realisation, not for the first time, of how much public services like the NHS just really matter and how important sufficient investment and funding is. I think with any luck, if we're in a position in a few months to start thinking about preparing for the next crisis that will come, then there'll be more understanding that we need to start looking at better solutions and investing in them um, so that we're left with making sure that we never have to deal with a crisis on this scale again, I would argue. So with that, I'll just leave that there.